I'm a hopeful person, but I wasn't always. Years ago, I married the love of my life, and we decided we wanted to have a family. For years, though, we endured the ups and downs of infertility. We suffered several miscarriages, regular negative pregnancy tests, and no baby. I'm a philosophy professor, so my natural response is to search for the truth. I read everything I could find about the causes and treatments for miscarriage and infertility. I painstakingly studied online blogs and followed the random advice of strangers. For example, in spite of my extreme fear of needles, I started acupuncture therapy. I mandated a diet of Brazil nuts for my husband, all because of an anecdotal story from an acquaintance who swore by the effectiveness of Brazil nuts in treating infertility. I was desperate, but I needed help. So my husband and I went to see a reproductive endocrinologist. This kind of doctor specializes in treating infertility. I underwent a series of tests, and given my unexplained infertility combined with my history of miscarriage, he informed us that the chances of having a successful pregnancy were extremely low. So he recommended in vitro fertilization, or IVF, a complex and costly assisted reproductive technology. We decided on IVF, and we went through the process. We later discovered that the procedure was unsuccessful. After the news, I still had to complete the IVF process with one final pregnancy test. In my sadness and anger, I lamented to the intake nurse at the hospital that I knew I wasn't pregnant, and this last step just poured salt on the wound. She stopped what she was doing, looked me squarely in the eyes, and said, "Honey, don't give up hope." No matter what they tell you about the odds, what she said really stuck with me. After that, my ears began to pick up the language of hope. What I didn't understand, though, is what people meant by hope. Emily Dickinson said, "Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul." Nietzsche described hope as the worst of all evils because it only prolongs the torments of man. Aristotle called hope a waking dream, and Dostoevsky said that to live without hope. Is to cease to live. We knew our chances of having a successful pregnancy were extremely low, so I couldn't understand why people would encourage us to hope. After that, my husband and I consulted with our doctor about what, if anything, to do next. He said we could try a second round of IVF, but this time, the odds were no better and possibly even lower. Nevertheless, he said there was still hope. I didn't know what to do. I could not reconcile the evidence with hope. The odds were stacked against us, and to base a de decision, excuse me, on the evidence offered us little support and almost no guidance. I've never felt so powerless in my entire life. I had no control, no direction, no insight into the future. No divine foreknowledge, and no baby. So at this point, you might be wondering why I introduced myself as a hopeful person. My story definitely doesn't paint a picture of hope, and to be honest, I had no hope throughout the entire process. My husband and I had to make a decision. So one beautiful morning, on the coast of Maine, we decided it was time. To let go of our dream of having our baby, we would remain a family of four. <laughs> Up to that point, I followed the evidence. I evaluated my options on the basis of the evidence and probabilities, but not possibilities. I allowed myself to be held captive to the limits of my body. Looking back, though, that decision. It was not a choice to give up. It was not a choice based on evidence. In fact, it was a choice directing me toward hope. Finally, I saw it. Hope empowers us and reorients us. That revelation transformed me. <clears throat> to choose hope. 
was to accept my limitations, the limitations that had defined me and held me back. To choose hope when the odds are against you and the stakes are high, to hope against hope is a test of character. And that's why I believe hope is a virtue. As a philosopher, I specialize in the study of ethics, so I've read a lot about virtue. A virtue is a disposition of character, an acquired trait that we cultivate over time. Virtues are not habits. Habits are patterns of behavior. But virtues go much deeper. To be virtuous is to be one who makes choices, acts, and feels in the right way. Aristotle described a virtue as being situated in between two extremes, one of excess and one of deficiency. And as such, virtues are excellences of character. For example, courage is a virtue, situated in between the excess of recklessness and the deficiency of cowardness. To be courageous is to be prudent and thoughtful. The courageous person knows when to face danger and when to take cover. Aristotle described the courageous as, be, as experiencing fear in the face of something that is fearful and being able to endure it in the right way. The virtues are valuable. They make life better, and they define who we are. Now, what is hope? Hope is classified in a variety of different ways as a mental state, a passion or emotion, a motivational factor, and a virtue. The standard definition defines hope as a combination of a desire for an outcome and a belief that that outcome is possible yet uncertain. In order to hope, one must see the outcome as possible and engage with it in some way. One cannot hope for the impossible or what is certain. The experience of hope can take different forms. For example, I hope for good weather. I hope to pass a test. I hope to run a marathon. But the virtue of hope stands out from our everyday hopes, the kinds of hopes that don't define our characters. My claim that hope is a virtue is controversial. Many ancient philosophers, such as Aristotle and Plato, believe that hope is a passion, a natural emotional response. <clears throat> hope fell into the category of passions like fear and despair. Hope was unfit to be a virtue because it was something that happened to us. It was not something that we could control or master. In contrast, though, a tradition following St. Paul, Augustine, and Aquinas believed that hope is a virtue and also a passion. Indeed, Aquinas claimed that hope is one of the three cardinal theological virtues. He claimed that hope is a disposition of the will in pursuit of the good, namely salvation with God. I think hope is a virtue that can be mastered when the stakes are high, when the odds are against us, and when uncertainty threatens us with powerlessness, the choice to hope defines who we are. To choose hope is to know when to push on in spite of uncertainty and when to take cover. So let me paint a picture of the virtue of hope so that you can better see what I see. When I picture hope, I see my husband. Now, most of you don't know my husband, so let me describe him to you. In our battle with infertility, I was paralyzed. But my husband, he was mobilized. Even against the odds, he was ready. He could face reality. And he had an earnestness about him. He was stable, and he was secure, and he could see that there was still the possibility of goodness in the world. His unshakable ability to confront our struggle was a mark of his virtue. Hope empowers us and sustains us when probabilities are not enough to base our happiness upon. Hope is not a promise or a guarantee of good things to come. Hope 
takes over when reason falls off and fails to offer us any direction. And our less than perfect knowledge threatens us with despair. Hope reliably guides us through the confusion by reorienting us. Hope is an antidote to the uncertainty and the ignorance that confronts us and threatens our sense of trust in the world. To choose hope is to, to cultivate, excuse me, a disposition to respond to uncertainty, mobilizing our powers of agency and fueling us to push on in pursuit of the possibility of the good. My story of infertility still breaks my heart, but I'm one of the lucky ones. A few weeks after our decision in Maine, we discovered that I was pregnant. After 40 weeks and 23 long hours of labor, our son finally came into the world. Thank you. <laughs>